Hello and welcome everyone to the Movement Made Better podcast. Our guest today from Florida, Coach John Sinclair. Sir, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself to the listeners, please. Yeah. Hey, everyone. My name is John Sinclair. I am the director of programming for the Institute of Motion. I also serve as a strength and conditioning coach and personal trainer, medical exercise specialist, all those wonderful things. I work as primarily as a coach now developing high school athletes. I've worked in the pro arena. I've been in, uh, worked with Olympic athletes, college athletes, but now I spend most of my time helping develop high school athletes here in South Florida. I'm originally from Lucky Lake, Saskatchewan, moved from Canada to Florida about almost eight years ago. So we've been down here enjoying the hot weather and never having to wear long pants. So we've been doing that for about eight years now. So it's not a bad place to be. Not too shabby. I know uh, when we chatted yesterday, one of the things that I kind of want to bring up was I listened to one of the episodes with Lance Walker on the Strength Coach podcast from Mike Boyle. And one of the things he had talked about was attacking versus absorbing ground force. And so I thought that was a pretty interesting perspective where he was talking about, are we teaching too much deceleration versus the ability to think about attacking the ground to get more explosive and more power out of it? Yeah, it's interesting. If, if you read some books by Charlie Francis, he's a legendary track coach. He coached Ben Johnson back in the day in Canada. And one of the things that he mentioned in his book, Speed Trap, was like, the idea of getting you to accelerate faster, you need to get as much as you can out of the ground. Mm -hmm. So the idea is to capture ground reaction force by driving into the ground. Whatever you give it, it's going to give you give it right back to you. Mm -hmm. So they would really focus on hammering the ground in their acceleration phase to the point where now they're at their top end speed, they're floating. They don't need to catch as much ground reaction force because now they just got to keep their top end speed high and not slow down because gravity in the ground eventually wants to slow you down. So if you watch any 100 meter race, if you look at Andre de Grasse from Canada, he won the 100 meter final here just, a, just last weekend, I think it was, in the Prefontaine class. Oh, Prefontaine, oh, that's right, yeah. yes. So he, he won that, but if you see, there's different rates of acceleration for each athlete, right? Some guys will get to their top end speed a little sooner. And then they start to slow down over after 60 meters. Some of them will be able to accelerate over a longer period of time. And all those guys have found an equal opportunity to be able to use the ground in the way that serves them best. Usain Bolt would do it a little bit differently, right? He had the really long legs, was a little slower out of the blocks because of his levers. So he would actually kind of run pigeon toed so he could capture as much energy through the elastic components of external rotation of the hip, right? Mm -hmm. Everyone say, well, wouldn't it be great if he ran with his toes forward? Well, not in that case, because he had such long limbs and he's starting from such a short block. When he attacks the ground, he needs to capture as much energy so he can get recoil out of it, right? And that's really what we're talking about is when we attack the ground, as soon as you hit the ground, you get a tenderness recoil that's firing you and allowing that potential energy and kinetic energy to drive you forward. Mm -hmm. So in the response to, well, if we're doing too much deceleration or absorbing too long, there's kind of two questions you have to ask. Number one is, why are we absorbing it? What is it? What is the outcome that we're looking for? Are we trying to change directions? Mm -hmm. If we're changing directions quickly, we don't want to absorb any of that energy, do we? Right. right? You see exactly. guys stick their foot in the ground, boom, and boom. they're gone in yes. the other direction. They'll use a drop step. A lot of times when we're thinking acceleration, I start in a symmetrical step, and you can test this with your athletes. As everyone stands with their feet shoulder width apart, toes pointed forward, and as you're on a start line, it's the first person to a cone wins, and you go like yes, and you clap their hands to see which foot is going to go forward. They will never step forward with their left foot or their right foot. Your first step is always going back. Mm, and the yeah. reason for it is if I can do that, I can drop my feet like I'm in a starter's block, but I'm catching energy to drive the ground that way, so it pushes me that way. Because whatever I give the ground, I'm going to get an equal and opposite reaction, right? Mm -hmm. And so the idea of deceleration is really about how do I position all those joints in their optimal instantaneous axis of rotation? So as soon as I hammer that ground, I can get out of it quickly. And what we fail to realize is that when we're decelerating, muscles are actually shutting off. Mm -hmm. They're not turning on. 
So when a muscle shuts off, that tells us to be able to absorb into that ground so that the joint can now get into its neutral position and the tendon can do its thing to drive us out of it. So at our most optimal environments, our muscles aren't actually doing a whole lot. (laughs) So our muscles are involved in starting us Mm -hmm. and then they just twitch to get out of the way so that the joint can continue to be in its optimal position so that the connective tissues can keep that momentum alive, right? We call that at IOM, we call that agile strength, the ability to change directions quickly while Mm -hmm. storing momentum and keeping that momentum alive. Yeah, it's fascinating that when he said that, to think about when you brought up the example of Barry Sanders, right? you know, you would think about, wow, yes, watching his highlights and growing up and watching him, thinking about, yeah, when he went to go cut and change directions, like you saw him just slap that foot into the into the ground, like he had bad intentions right away, like boom, he attacked, boom. Yep. What made him such a fen- phenom was the fact that he put that foot into the ground and the angular acceleration was phenomenal coming out of it. Yeah. And, you know, if we go back and look at all those great athletes, they never had to be taught that. Yeah. Right? Like now we're trying to teach people how to do that. And I, I sometimes wonder, is it, are we trying to teach them or are we trying to unteach them the things we've taught them? <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. Is that we've become so structured in the way that we present performance now that kids don't e- even go out and play and learn these things on your own. Mm-hmm. Right? If you, if you learn to play hockey, you will also apply those same principles when you're playing the game of soccer. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. And you'll want to go play soccer like hockey because that's how, that's the perspective and the, and the playability that you have in your brain as to where do I want to take this game? I make fun of soccer players all the time, not because I don't think they're great athletes, but I can go out and play soccer because I played hockey. Why? You had to be able to handle the puck in your skates and the same motor patterning of passing the puck with my left foot is no different than me passing the puck or passing a ball with my left foot is no different than me passing the puck with my left hand. So we store those mat- motor patterns mm-hmm. exactly the same way. And I start to wonder now, is, is it that we're, because we're only playing one sport, that we're losing a lot of the motor programming that would become inherent from us playing on different surfaces and different, uh, with different games and in different rules. And, and just like we talked about with goal ball here before we started, you know? You learn different things when the environments change. And I think that the athletes of yesteryear played so many different sports that training to them was an odd thing. Like you've heard Bo Jackson say it a million times. I didn't learn how to throw a baseball. I was throwing rocks since I was just a little guy. I didn't work out. I did archery because it was more relaxing. I didn't need to work out. I was an athlete. Yeah, and that's a big part of it because, I mean, I think the old school athletes, too, in the offseason, most of them had manual labor jobs because they didn't make the money that they make today. Right. So that's a big difference maker there, too. Yeah, two of my favorite pictures are Gordy Howe and Bobby Hull in the offseason. You know, when you see these guys with massive arms, you know, big shoulders, just absolutely jacked, and Bobby Hull's out there pitching hay on on the family farm, you know, which would set him up to be really robust and resilient and he was always known as the guy with the hardest slap shot you know in his time very true yeah a lot of stories of goaltenders that would try to actually get out of the way of his shot <laughs> I, forget, <laughs> I forget who the hell it was it was i think it was don cherry was talking about that the one time and the goalie and the goalie moved and he's all like got on him like what are you doing he's all like well i'm not standing in front of that shot are you kidding me because back then they didn't wear, they weren't wearing face masks. So he's all like, and face masks and their pads were pretty thin, pretty thin. Oh yeah. yeah. I mean, in the 1970s for people that play hockey nowadays, especially goalies. Yeah. You guys got it really easy compared to goaltenders back then. And yeah, like you felt now. that stuff. Yeah. Nothing hurts now. Yeah. I used to come home from practice with bruises all the time from just my coach. And that's not, he's not blistering shots, but it still yeah. hurt. So it was interesting was thinking about in change of direction, you know, you had alluded to the stiffness of the tendons. And so it's interesting because Dr. Keith Barr has been talking about how we now have the genetic codes to understand if somebody has what quality of connective tissue they have that's predetermined essentially and how that should affect our training. Yeah, it's predetermined. It's also dependent by tendon length itself, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, a classic example that might highlight this is 
uh, two different jumpers that get the same outcome, but in a completely different way would be like watching Michael Jordan stick his foot in the ground and he just springs, right? There's not a lot of knee bend. There's not a lot of absorption of force versus like a Dominique Wilkins was a two foot jumper, right? So he would mm-hmm. take off on two feet mm-hmm. and then he would be right underneath the rim and dunk it. So he would have like lots of ankle flexion, lots of knee flexion, lots of hip flexion when he would dunk a basketball versus Jordan, he'd take one foot, put it in the ground, boom, he would take off. Wasn't a lot of ankle flexion. There wasn't a lot of knee flexion. There wasn't a lot of hip flexion. He would just capture that energy from the ground and go. Question is what's better depends on the person, right? If you yeah. tried to take Jordan and ask him to bend deep before he jumped, I mean, he was a good enough athlete. He'd probably figure out a way to do it, but he wouldn't do it while dribbling as he's going, that kind of thing. And if you ask Dominique Wilkins to take off on that one foot and explode up, probably wouldn't get the same result as if he was, you know, positioning himself so that he could take off on two, you know? And so the question now becomes is, you know, as we're trying to, you know, I think our society is always, which one's better, Mm -hmm. you know, and we're all, we're always searching for the, which one is better, especially uh, here in North America. And the reality is it's finding, letting that athlete find out what's natural to them and then enhance their ability based on their natural style. That's the approach I take with it now. If I'm just a regular trainer who's working with an athlete, how do I start to kind of unwrap that ideology as far as how do I train this person? Do I understand? How do I know if this person is a little bit more natural at being stiffer versus a little more subluxed, a little more, you know, lax? Yeah. The question would be is, you know, give them an outcome based task, Mm -hmm. right? And then ask them to perform it. So it might be stick a ruler up in the air, like fairly high, ask them to go get it, right? Don't give them any rules. Don't tell them how to do it. And then now start doing that. Oh, you know what? He bends a little bit when he jumps, right? Mm -hmm. Well, let's see if we do a push up. Try to push up as quickly as you can, or just a landing drill, right? Like step off of this box, your basic depth jump, go into a land and let's see how, how you, how you want to absorb force. And I think what, your biology will find the most efficient way to do it. You might be kind of clumsy and uncoordinated at first, but generally most people will have have developed those basics of motor learning Mm -hmm. by the time us trainers get to them, you know, and you will see how they be, how they have a propensity to do certain movements in certain ways. If they're complete motor morons and have never been off the couch, you know, not to disrespect anybody, but If they don't spend a lot of time playing sports or haven't done a lot of activities before, then you might have to kind of guide them and find some different ways. And it's okay failing and picking the wrong one. You're not going to, you know, destroy anybody, but it does give you an idea, at least for me, is when I watch athletes, I just want to watch them move. I'll give them, here's the object of this drill. Here's what I'd like you to do. Away you go. And they're like, how do you want me to do it? No, just go. Let me, let me have a look at you. And then that Mm -hmm. gives me a better picture of, all right, are they a fast twitch kind of person? Do they absorb energy well? Do they bleed energy out of out of some joints because they're just uncoordinated? Are they going through a growth spurt and that's what's causing the that awkwardness, right? Mm-hmm. All those things kind of play out over time. Well, I think what's interesting too is, is trying to figure out, okay, once we kind of figure out what type of tissue quality we're dealing with with the athlete, what are we trying to do afterwards? I think a lot of people try to overcorrect in some mm. regards, right? They is it more about just trying to better develop that athlete, or more of just imp- or a lot of coaches trying to impose their own things on these athletes? Yeah, I think it's a bit of the latter. You know, I think we're we're we've been taught in school there's one way to do something. Mm-hmm. This is the right way. In order for me to mark you and determine that you understand this concept, right? Yeah, and th- that's the challenge is that there isn't one way that works for every person. That's why muscle and fiction or whatever you want to call their magazine. Um, you know, that's the struggles that we get in because in order to sell magazines, you have to perpetuate that ideology, which is what's better, this or this, or what's the mm-hmm. top 10 for this, or, you know, and you and I have, all three of us have taught all over the world and we answer lots of questions and it's usually what would be better? I yes. do this or I do that. Right. And yeah. it's a societal thing. I don't think it's necessarily just our industry. I think, We're always looking for what is the simplest, most easily explained reason for a particular question. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I give them the awful answer that every good presenter gives, right? Which is, it depends. (laughs) 
which drives them crazy. Yeah, because I, I think, un- unfortunately, people want a canned answer. They want something that just is definitive. And that's the tough part of what we do is, is there a set line? And no, that line's always moving and, t- and taking different shapes. And, you know, I, I always tell them, like, I was where you were at one time in my career, right? Like, be patient. You'll yeah. probably figure this self this stuff out on your own right? You'll probably follow an ideology and then you'll realize, oh, that didn't work so well. And then you'll have a divergent path and then you'll find a new way and then you'll have another divergent path. And then it'll all start to come full circle and you'll be like, okay, now I'm starting to get the hang how this whole body thing works itself out. Once you've done, you know, a couple hundred thousand training sessions, (laughs) you start to figure it out. And that just makes people go, oh my God, why am I doing this? Right? Yeah. Well, we get it a lot. Uh, especially with the sticks, yeah. how often? How often should I use the this these sticks? And we're kind of like you move every day, right? So <laughs> yeah. it's kind of like, but people want to know. Okay, well, how much time every yeah. week do I devote to mobility training? How much time do I devote to strength training? How much you know? So they want that in a in a can, basically. And it's tough to get people to figure to say, okay, well, you kind of got to play it by feel more than anything. You really do. I mean, I don't know what I'm going to do in my program until I wake up that day because okay. I've got to the point now where I have an idea what theme I want to train. Mm-hmm. But if I wake up and you know I'm not feeling it at 100% of my ability or I've got some joint pain or anything else, those subjective feelings kind of guide what direction I'm going to take my warm up, what how I'm going to do what activation stuff I'm going to do, what mobility stuff I'm going to do, and then determine what my volume of strength training, if that's my theme of the day, what, how much volume am I going to do? What type of movements am I going to do? Is it going to be odd position strength? Or is it going to be starting strength? You know, those kinds of things. But I think the big challenge for everybody is that we, because we learn in such a silo, we're looking for answers in a silo. And it isn't until we start to gain some experience of coaching lots of people that you should have a system in place but that system is like the matrix, right? So mm-hmm. you, you know that I plugged my computer disk in, the matrix is on, but what's going on in there depends on a whole set of variables. And you just fit and finish what you need to do to make that person move a little bit better at that given moment and then build from there. I think that's you know especially the case when you're training a lot of the general population, especially that 40 and older crowd, you know, they're at the desk all day and yep. sometimes they come in, they're like, you know, my back hurts. Yeah. So then you got to switch. There it goes right my away. deadlift pr- plan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So this great deadlift program ready for you. Oh, yeah. my back's kind of <laughs> bugging me. Oh, now what do I do? Yeah. So you take that clipboard and you just kind of like, whoop, oh, there goes yeah. that. Yeah. Cause you got to be able to adapt on the fly and that's that critical thinking. And that's the art of coaching. Really? You got it. You couldn't have said it any better. The, the ability to be able to create on demand is your greatest ability as a coach. I think that's for us, what's always differentiated a trainer versus a coach yeah. is trainers. Just you know, give me something I can implement. And if I can implement it, well, then I'm just going to avoid it altogether. Right. So is there anything in regards to maybe some things that you do a lot more of than what you typically see most trainers doing? Well, I haven't seen what a lot of trainers are doing because I'm a hermit in my garage right now coaching <laughs> people. But, so if anyone that's actually watching this that knows I, I have a studio in Davie, Florida with my friend Andy Hanley, you know Andy from mm-hmm. NASM. So, but since COVID, I've just been training people out of my garage. So I don't get to hang out and see what all the cool kids are doing nowadays. But yeah. some of the stuff that I have been doing, my good friend, Adam Wolf out of Chicago, is, nice. who's yes. a great physical therapist there. You guys know him well. I've been studying a little bit of some of the things that he's doing at, from a therapist standpoint. And that's looking at brain-based movement prescription and looking nice. at kind of some of the higher brain center things that are going on and why we have predominance to want to do things in certain in certain directions. And so I've started incorporating more vestibular based activities wow. or activation uh, for warm ups with my with the kids that I'm coaching. So we can start to activate the eyes, we can activate the ears, the jaw position, our head tilts, you know, doing the yes, 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 no, no, no drills, incorporating juggling drills, uh, getting kids better with their hand eyes, hand and eyes and feet. And getting those working together because in sport, if you don't have your hands, your eyes, or your feet, you're going to have a hard time playing the sport they're currently playing. So the goal then is to challenge their vestibular system a little bit as a a higher end activation stimulation sequence 
and been incorporating that with with a lot of the kids and it's been it's been cool you know i had in one particular instance who i've been doing it quite frequently with his name is gunner and he's a lacrosse goaltender he's mm-hmm. committed to us navy he had a goals against average as a lacrosse goalie dennis you'll appreciate this of 3.1 this year oh damn and was and was a state champion this year so i was like how do you have a goals against of three yeah. in lacrosse, right? In high school as a state champion. And so it's not like he was just playing rec league, you know, or whatever, where guys didn't know how to catch a ball. Like, yeah. he's a, you know, he's playing against the top schools. And so we're starting to see that, okay, some of this is paying off that you can drop your goals against in half, you know, wow. from just activating your eyes and finding different ways that we can trick your eye and distract your eye so you can constantly be seeing what's going on out the back door while you, while the ball's over here, you know? Well, I think that was what's interesting is years ago when I saw, especially like for goaltenders, because if someone's cranking, getting ready to crank a shot from the high slot, yeah. I mean, that's literally only like 20 feet in front of you, yeah, 25 feet, but you physically don't have the time from the release of the shot to the time it actually hits you yeah. to consciously make the decision of how to react. You it's it. your eyes, the input that the eyes have, it becomes an, an involuntary reflex. You got so it. the eyes process right at the impact of the stick to the puck. And it, yep. within a fraction of a second, it gets a general idea of where the puck is directed and then which limb to move at which angle and, and which height. And I was also got like, it. oh, you got it. And so we've even played a, around with some of the traditional ways in which he's a righty. So he holds a stick like this and where he gets beat is down on his, no, sorry, he's a lefty and he gets beat down towards his left foot because okay. they want you to do that. Yeah. Oh, right? gotcha. Yes. And I, so I said, like, think of how slow that motion is to go from here to here when somebody's just zinging a ball at you, mm-hmm. right? It, I don't even know what it is in feet per second or meters mm-hmm. per second, but it's moving faster than that than this motion is going to be. Mm-hmm. I said, what if you took your top hand off it and just drove your hand this way? Because is it more important for you to control the ball after you've stopped it or let the ball go through past you and into the net? I don't think a coach would yell at you that you didn't have control of it I would rather it be out in front of me and me trap it after I've blocked it the first time. We started playing with some unconventional ways of looking at how quickly does the eye perceive that information and how quickly can I make my hands move instead of my whole body have to move, right? Mm. Because you'll see lacrosse goalies in college get beat there all the Uh, time. Those guys are so accurate. Yeah. Right? So they're trying to do a split with no equipment on to try to hopefully, you know, get it with their leg, but now they're dropping their entire level down which is even slower you're assisted by gravity but you're lowering all your mass instead of just flicking your hand through right and so we're playing around with different things like that to have this comprehension of your eyes and hands can communicate Mm -hmm. subconsciously or unconsciously faster than your whole body as a unit can can react that way and so that's why some of these baseball players focus so much on hand speed instead of bat speed right because mm-hmm. you don't have time to to move your whole body to predict it. That's why they they start moving in towards the ball while the ball's coming, right? They don't wait till it's right there and then try to hit it. So we have to try and be proactive as a goalie to be able to react to multiple stimuli at once, but then key on one and re- and just go, like make it involuntary. Because as soon as you think about it, you're already beat. Yeah. So, yeah. So has he implemented that in a game? He hasn't yet. We started, we started thinking about it and I don't, he's not comfortable yet. Right. So he's got one more full year of high school and it's, you just got to keep practicing and practicing and practicing, practicing until you feel comfortable. Cause he's got, I mean, he probably started when he was like eight years old. So he's got, and he's 17 now. So he's got like nine years of this. Yeah. It's a deep pattern to have to deprogram. So it's really just, you know, him kind of piddling around with it first. And then when you get to Navy, those Navy coaches scream at you. <laughs> what are you doing? Don't do doing? that anymore. So it's, it's one of those things like, do you want to do it? You know, you know I'm going to be a rookie going on to the Navy. I don't want to piss anyone off. Well, if he's not letting any goals through, then I, I don't think they'll care. Yeah, that's a good point. I think for me, yeah, that would be a pretty natural movement for me, having grown up playing goalie. With the stick in the right hand, just coming across, just using the hand, that would be. Well, pretty... you're actually using your stick now. Goalies in hockey Goalies don't use in... their stick anymore, which yeah. I don't understand. 
Have you seen that too? Yeah. Like they're they're sticks this high off the ice all the time. What happened with that? And, their, and their blade is turned this way. It doesn't make any sense to me. I'm, and why is and why is their glove here? I, dude, I don't get. Dude, I. They start here, <laughs> and then the shot goes, and they do this. Right. When here, I can block anything like this, really easy. This requires this. It, right, and it, right? and you can't close that distance. You can't. Right. I mean, how fast they're moving, and then you've got the biggest guys in the world that are spending all their time on the ice. Yeah. Why are they going down with every shot? It, yeah. it's, it blows my mind why how goaltenders in hockey behave nowadays in their in their approach to stopping pucks. They must have a better understanding of it than me because their goals against are pretty is pretty darn good. But it drives me crazy watching it because I can't understand what the rationale is. Well, I think what's interesting is the the days of a dominant cash. Are, I don't know if we'll see that again. Right, right? where it was just. Okay, let me be spontaneously athletic yeah. because Dominic Kashuk is ridiculously athletic, right? Yeah. Versus, you know, goalies today are just about positions and, and playing percentages. Okay, so that goes to our previous comment in that we don't put any credence into the style of that particular athlete, right? Mm-hmm. So what do we do? We put them into hockey schools and we make them all do the same thing. Mm-hmm. Like when you and I were growing up watching hockey players, you didn't need to n- know the name on the guy's back. You didn't even mm-hmm. need to know his number. You knew just watching him skate. That's Dino Cicerelli. Yeah. That's, that's Ali Afredi. That's, yeah. you know, didn't matter who you were looking at, right? Mm-hmm. You knew the way they skated. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. Tight turn into the boards. Oh, that's definitely Joe Sackick, right? right? Like, <laughs> like I can see him anywhere on the ice mm-hmm. because everyone skated differently. It was like their fingerprints. Yeah. And yeah. now we're, we're creating factories like we do in education. We're creating factories of this is how you build a hockey player. This is how you build mm-hmm. a goalie, right? This is how you build a defenseman. They all look exactly the same, right? Yeah, very true. There's, there's no way you're going to find a Dominic Kashuk ever again because his yeah. goal was stop the puck. Didn't matter regardless how. Of, yeah, regardless didn't matter of how, how. His foot over the back of his head. and Well, yeah. I, well he was the first goalie that I saw drop the, drop the stick to grab the puck. Right. With his hand, right? Which I didn't grow up with. Yeah. But when I saw that, I was like, oh, that makes so much more sense. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it really did. It was such yeah. a simple thing, but you're like, well, yeah, I yeah. let go of the stick. I just, the puck's there, boom, just put my hand on it and grab it. Now I have full control of it versus trying to dick around with the stick <laughs> yeah. and maybe missing an angle or giving my opponent now time to retrieve the puck. Yep. It, it took somebody like him to actually do it. Right. And what's interesting now is still nobody does it, even no. though you know how effective it is. I think coaches coach certain things to satisfy their ego or to justify their position. Mm. Right. So if you are a defensive minded coach, you're going to coach a defensive minded system, even though you don't have a lot of defensive minded players on your team. Mm-hmm. right because that's what got you to the dance so you're going to do that because that's what you have confidence in and i'm going to make everybody change to serve my needs instead of doing what Sather did he didn't try to change anything he just went no uh give him the puck <laughs> that guy yeah. Gretzky, yeah let him tell the system give him the puck he'll figure it out yeah you know and you build what you're going to build around the talent that you have on the team and as a coach you should have the ability to do that that's why the minnesota vikings will never win a Super Bowl, that's who my team is. Because <laughs> they got Zimmer as their head coach. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's one of the things I've learned over the years is is just seeing we're just trying to jam all these square pegs into round holes. Got it. And instead of just letting people it's like you said a little earlier ago, you give five people the same task and you're gonna see five variations of executing that task. Got it. Got it. Who- who cares? You mm-hmm. hit a bullseye five times. Who cares? Did you watch any of the air pistol shooting no. in, in the Olympics? No. Yeah, Fasc- I saw some of that. Fascinating for me. How you'd have the same people at the highest level in the world all would have a different stance. Yep. Oh. Right? I saw more of the so air you'd, rifle. You'd have some guys that are like this. Boom. Yeah. Right? And then you'd have some that were pretty traditional. You had all these different cool stances and you're like, they're still getting the job done. But it was like, you know... In that, they all found what made them feel the most still to be the most accurate. You know, and if you watch biathlon in the Winter Olympics, you'll watch how they all rest the gun differently against their cheek. You know, they've been 
Nordic skiing and then they got to pull their gun, shoot their yeah. target, and they all find different ways to change their breathing rate in order to get the outcome done. Because that sport's about, I got to get as fast around the track as I can and as accurate with my shots so I don't get a penalty. There's the task. And I don't understand why in North America we're so stuck on this is the way we have to do things. This is the right way. This is the optimal way. This is the best way you do it. So well, looking at that individual and customizing how they take their style and you enhance their style so that they become more efficient and economical on their terms. And I think I'm seeing that, unfortunately, we're affecting the rest of the world because our that style is starting to be absorbed in other countries. Right. You know, so that you're starting to see more of that, especially when I travel Southeast Asia. A lot of the coaches there are kind of like, well, there's a right way and a wrong way. And you're like, well, there's a right way and a wrong way for each person, depending on his or her abilities. That's right. So unfortunately, I think that's starting to pro- proliferate a little too much in regards well, it's to It's almost like wherever the noise is, right? That's where mm-hmm. the tension goes. So if there's noise about a particular hand position in sprinting, then like I don't ever remember seeing people running like this. Mm-hmm. Now, how many sprinters in college do you see running like this? Mm-hmm. Nowhere growing up did I grow up and start running this way. You know, it was, I run like this because that's, my hands help drive my feet. So that's where, how I'm going to run. I don't understand where the scissor thing came from. Well, I kind of know where it came from. It came from us, <laughs> from us watching people run a race going that way, but watching them from this vantage point. But, so it made it look like their arms were going like this. Like that, yeah. but, right? So it made yeah. it look like this, but it's yeah. actually going like this. Across your body, right? right? Yeah. So you got that shortening and lengthening going on. But it was biomechanists looking at tape of the camera going this way and going, well, that's how they run and not looking. Well, no, this is a three dimensional look at it, not a, you know, not a one dimensional perspective. Yeah, we saw this really cool slow mo of Usain Bolt, this little breakdown of his sprinting and it showed his hand motion, but it also showed his spine, you know, going in that little bit of lateral, lateral, lateral flexion, rotation. Yeah, Yeah. Uh, I'll have to send that to you. Well, it would make sense, right? The best cue you could ever give an athlete is your head always needs to be over your foot. Mm -hmm. Think of any sport. Like if I'm going from left leg to right leg, my head has to be over my base of support. In order to get there, I have to rotate and side flex. So it doesn't matter what I do. And I've had these arguments with power skating coaches because I was a power skating coach too. I was like, Mm -hmm. you cannot skate with your head in the midline and your your legs going this way. You're not going anywhere, (laughs) right? So every time you stride, your head gets over top of your foot. Yes. And then you take off on this leg and your head gets over top of your foot on this side. That's how we skate. Go watch a speed skater. You don't have to be a genius to figure this out. It's right in front of you. Right. right? You shift your head over your foot in everything that we do. If you're going to dig a ball in volleyball and it's off to the midline of your body, your head's coming with it towards your target. So your mm-hmm. head's always going to be over your foot. It's the easiest cue you could ever give somebody. You would have power skating coaches that would argue that, huh? Yeah. More later in in my career, because then they they tried to take a linear approach to power skating, which Mm -hmm. is push off, glide on that one leg, and then and stay still. And and I was still like, well, how are you gonna have any speed, especially when you're turning, if your head's in your midline? There's no way you're gonna be able to turn in a tight circle if your head's in your midline. Your whole blade's gonna be on the ice, not the outer edge of your blade if you're going to your left. So I would I would post pictures of Connor McGregor. Yeah. He's one of the most beautiful skaters I've ever seen in my yeah. life and watch him going around the net on the, in the all-star game, the yeah, fastest skater yeah. thing. And he's way over Barry Sanders. Same thing. He'd put yeah, a cut in and over. half his body's over there, but his yeah. head's right over top of his foot or, and, or his body is spread out that, that balance point over his foot. So he's got an arm way out like this, you know, to help spread that out or kicking his leg underneath them on the other side. So. So if you have a younger kid who, for some reason, well, for all the reasons we talked about, is very stiff through the spine and is very linear in their movement, what is one of the easiest things or one of the ways that you help transition getting them a little bit more comfortable with that spinal flexion and extension? Yeah, the one challenge that we have is that kids go through growth spurts, right? So Mm -hmm. the challenge with that is that yeah, their mobility and their flexibility is not going to be as great. And it's going to take some time for them to go through that. The most important thing is you provide the environment that just allows for a movement to occur on their terms and as naturally as possible. Now, in saying that, the goal is to try and create some sort of story that connects with them 
mm-hmm. that might get that them to understand where their spine is. Because if you ask a young kid to uh, get in athletic ready position, and then you ask them to stick their ass out, they actually do the opposite, right? So if I'm here and I say, okay, get in athletic ready position, and they're kind of more like this, right? Yeah. They have that video game posture. Yeah. Right? And so they're flexed at the spine. You say, stick your ass out. And they do that, right? (laughs) Their tail of the dog actually gets lower and lower, you know? So then we have to say, all right, well, what if you were a horse? Let's get you on, let's get you on all fours. If I was going to ride you right now, you'd want to kind of position your, your spine to be able to hold me, right? Don't let me slide off the back yet. If you were Mm -hmm. a horse, how might that look? And they go into that anterior tilt. So, so they're now out of gravity loaded position and in a novel position that they go, okay, well now stand up. Can you find that position with your hips? Mm -hmm. The other way I'll do is I'll start from the ground and move them up. So we might put them on a box or something like that and have them find athletic ready position so they can, you know, use their ischial tuberosities as something that kind of becomes little feedback markers to help them find what that position's like. I use constraints quite Mm -hmm. a bit. So if I get someone that's maybe squatting and they're kind of in this position and they're squatting on their toes and they're falling, coming forward, Mm -hmm. I'll stand right in front of them and just say, okay, squat. And then they're like, well, I'm going to run into you. No, stand straight up from here. Just don't touch me. Right. And they'll do it. So do it a few times and then you just kind of back away, keep going. Right. And they kind of find it that way. So those are some unique ways that I try to assist the motor pattern. And in terms of spinal flexion and extension or side flexion, it's usually by, um, trying to find an environment that will kind of do that authentically. That's why I I love using stick mobility or using Viper Pros, things like that. So a tilting series, they're focused on the actual, the tool, Mm -hmm. not on the movement itself, because then they can kind of get stuck in their ways or they, or they're distracted by what their body's doing as opposed to what the task is. So doing a tilt of that or do a zombie stab with the stick, right? So there's a zombie down there. Is he's crawling, he's got no legs, and you take that stick and stab him in the head. Oh, you know, yeah, and so they'll yeah. do something like that. And then that the task itself is stab a zombie, but, yeah, but they're yeah. going through spinal Ooh. flexion with emotion, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. They change so tr- the names of our exercises. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah I'm kind of gross. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but if you can create stories like that and environments like that, then now those movements become more tasks. And then the abilities become realized because you gave them a task that had some sort of outcome or purpose that they could relate. I was just thinking, you know, for that athletic position, I wonder if you could almost get them to do piggyback rides. Oh, it's brilliant. You know, brilliant. That could, that how many times do we do that well. as kids and yeah, nobody yeah. does them anymore, right? Yeah. yeah. My good friend, Gio, uh, Giovanni Roselli, you guys know yeah. Gio, right? Yeah. yeah. He, yeah. Just yeah. Did, he just did a blog yesterday on on how to prepare for a long day of piggyback rides with your, with your girl. Oh, that's right. Yes. You know? So he's, yes. he's got to check that out. Yeah. He's yes. got a blog he calls daddy daycare or something like that. So where he's talking about how to prepare yourself for being a dad at home, looking after your little one kind of thing. It's really cute. You can't prepare. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't know. Brutal. <laughs> so, you know, working at the high school level now and being at the professional level, have you found one more challenging than the other? Way working harder. with pros is way harder. And not just in terms of just, there's just more complexities. There's more, well, what's the easiest way to explain it? Training isn't necessarily the thing that's most important to them. We often joke when I first meet a professional player, I'll say, what's the most important thing? Getting you stronger, faster, getting your next contract. Oh. Right? And they go, oh, no, getting the next your contract. contract. Like, yes. Hey. So, so let's do less about the whole training stuff and let's keep you healthy throughout this year, the next year, so you can sign another contract. So once you shift the perspective that way, then it's not tough. But if, he, if an athlete comes in that has worked with other trainers in the past and wants to do things in a certain way because they've had that divergent way of thinking from where you're thinking, mm-hmm. then you have to try and meet them where they need to be met. And eventually that will help out. With kids, it's easier because you just, they trust you, A, your role model for them. There's someone they can look up to. I try to keep myself, have the ability that I can move better than most of these young athletes. And I want to keep it that way so that I can say like, this is how we do it. Like, yeah. let's go to the, let's go to the field and we'll throw the football around and I'll school you. You know uh-huh. what I mean? And so having that ability helps and they look up to you. And so it's a little bit easier that way. I feel like I can 
we can get some trust and some rapport built there. But also a kid, I just really love working with high school kids. I really do. I never thought I would, but I'm starting to find now and being in South Florida, it's helped because I can now have kids instead of just for one off season. I have them from the time they're 12 till the time they're 18. Oh, that's pretty cool. Which is yeah. great, right? Because then yeah. when, with pro athletes, they're coming and going and they might mm-hmm. be with you for one summer and then they go somewhere else. Or, mm-hmm. And that's a little bit more challenging. You know, I've worked with this one little kid. Her name's Natalie. I started with her when I think she was 12 and she's now the number one ranked tennis player for her age in all of the USA. Oh, oh nice. You know? awesome. And to, de- to see her development happen over a period of, you know, six years, it's really fascinating. And, and to watch her flourish and now get, you know, on her day of recruitment for college, she's getting like 20 calls from universities all over, all over the place, you know? And so that's kind of cool. So I find it more rewarding uh, working with the high school kids, but also just the experience of watching them grow up and watching them go from little kids to young adults is, is really cool. And watching those stages in between. That's fascinating. It's interesting is like what you talked about in regards to too much specificity in training with young kids at at a certain age. What's interesting is I got a football player who's 15 and bounding laterally for him is a real task. Like it's really hard and he's a defensive back. And I was like, okay, so you're missing that ability to bound laterally, which really is affecting the way you backpedal and change direction coming out of that backpedal too. Sure. So it's interesting watching him have the, he can shuffle laterally, yeah, but the actual bounding laterally is a vastly different task for him. Wow. It's yeah. so much harder. And that's why I said, you know, our goal as coaches should really be in from a development standpoint is develop motor abilities mm-hmm. then tasks then sport, then some uh, movement variability, and then some sport-specific variability, right? So mm-hmm. it's like step number four, but a lot of the parents will come to us and go, hey, do you know all those ladder drills? I think they need to do ladder drills, you know, <laughs> right? Because they right. see it on TV or they see it on the internet. They see a tennis player using it. And they're like, oh, are you going to incorporate the ladder today? It's like, well, no, we're going to work on this ability today, you know? And And so that's the challenge is that we have to realize wherever that client is, we got to meet them where they need to be met, but also realize that in today's, when a new athlete comes to, to uh, sit down and, and meet with me, I got to see, well, what are their movement abilities first? Mm -hmm. And then how well do they transition that into tasks? Well, it's interesting because I was asking him what his programming is for varsity football, you know, because the school he goes to is a private school. They do recruiting. Uh, so they invest a lot of money in their training programs. And it was interesting. I was, cause I'm like, are you doing this, 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 and this? And he's like, no, 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 no. And I was like, oh, wow. Well, that's to me, a lot of the elements that need to be trained for an athlete, especially a football player. And you're telling me that you're not getting any of this in the system that's already implemented. So I thought that was a pretty telling storyline as far as, okay, well, when you're here with me, this is what you're going to get. You know, I'm going to give you all the stuff that you're not getting at your school program. Well, that's the best way to build value for yourself too, and for any mm-hmm. coaches out there. Is you know that's that's the value of cross training and cross training mechanically, or cross training from a motor development standpoint, cross training from a, a metabolic standpoint. Mm-hmm. Do, offering the things that they're not getting from their practices, their games, and then they have a weight training program do something different than what you're doing in the weight room. Don't come to me to do the same stuff you're doing at the weight room. Exactly. So that was interesting because I was like, well, I think that's a big reason why you're having some of the issues in the hamstrings that you're having. So I said, when you're here, we're going to give you all the stuff that you're not getting five, you know, Monday through Friday. So let's make you a little bit more well-rounded athlete. but he's been playing that sports. You know, that's really the only sport he plays. Yeah. So it's so kind of like getting in, we're in, isn't it? Yeah, there's so much specificity because there's dollars at stake, really, when you really think about it. I think a lot of people, a lot of parents see their kids as, oh, well, you know. That's all these club sports, too. Club sports. Coaches in the club sports will tell you, hey, if you don't come to this summer program, I don't know if you're going to be on the team in the fall. I mean, like, come on. Well, everything you guys are 
are hitting on and that we're talking about. I'm building a course right now on considerations of programming for the single sport athlete. Oh, nice. And so um, that's part of our AWHPS uh, level three program that we got going on at the Institute of Motion. So we got level one, a level two, and then we're writing that content as we speak actually for that. I'm oh, filming fantastic. the lectures for that. But Excellent. Fantastic. Yeah. Sherry and I just watched the uh, goal ball on uh, the Paralympics last night. Oh, yeah. It's awesome. I played that in university. Yeah. So it was fascinating to watch blind people play that. That was yeah. just unbelievable. Like, I was like, they feel distance and they hear direction. Like, that's, yeah. but to put, like, if you didn't know that they weren't blind, like, yeah. you'd be like, they're really great athletes. Their reaction time is on yeah. point. Like they know where each other is in space. Like I was telling yeah. Neil, they don't run into each other. Yeah. Like I thought it was just fascinating. Incredible. It's to crazy. See. Cause there's so much communication going on. Imagine all the chatter you have to like block out to know who you're talking to. Right. Well, it was just, it was yeah. interesting because they're on the field. Like when they're setting up for defense, like the, they're feeling the line to know yeah. where they are in relation to the, to the net. So the defenders are all like touching the floor and the tape. And then, uh, yeah, they bounce the ball. So the, the ball person bounces it to the, to the attacker. So that way they know where the ball is. And then the other team, I assume that lets them know that the ball is getting ready to be put into play. Right. But yeah, we wa- it yeah. was a fascinating game. It's crazy. I got a funny story, but well, not really funny. It was a beautiful story, actually. I, I was in uh, Calgary, Alberta, Canada, and I was putting on a workshop. And that morning, I was staying at a, at a hotel that had an entire bus filled with a goal ball team. Oh, So they nice. all came to the hotel, and they all had their C&I dog with them. Okay. And so it was beautiful. So the next morning I wake up and I'm, I'm a massive dog fan. Like we don't have children, we have dogs. So it was cool to see is that, you know, they're walking around with their dogs and the dogs are helping them into the room and stuff. And in this one particular occasion, I'm downstairs having breakfast. It was an open seated area, but you could see like going up to the steps to the second floor of the rooms. Mm -hmm. And this one girl was trying to get her key in the door and she wasn't quite getting it. And the golden retriever came up, put her note, Put his nose oh, underneath, whoa. underneath her thing, like a millimeter, and boom, in. Crazy. And it was just like, I just like started crying right then and there. I was like, that was the most beautiful thing I've <laughs> wow. ever seen, like in terms of training, you know? <laughs> Dang. So cool. Wow. Yeah, a whole, whole busload of gold ball players. That yeah, was pretty neat. Yeah, that was my first time seeing that. I don't know if it was the first time in the Olympic in the Paralympics or if it's been in no, there. Oh, it's been before. around for a while. Like when I was in, I think I took my adapted physical education class in like ninety five. Okay. Yeah, probably 1995, and we we would play it. So as being able bodied, they blindfold you, and oh. then uh, and then you'd have to play. You know, they got a bell in the ball, and yeah. I don't know if that's what they still do, but that's what the, what we were using. There's a bell inside the ball, and that's how you would like hear when the ball's coming. So it was a really fun game. Wow. How yeah. how hard was it? Uh, well, it was. I grew up playing a lot of hand hockey. You know, like we would okay. do that with kids. So. Mm-hmm. And, and do that with your brothers. And so moving around on my hands and knees wasn't too bad. So they had us all on our hands and knees. We weren't mm-hmm. up running around, right? So you're down on your hands and knees as they move the ball back and forth. And it wasn't too bad. It was, it was really enjoyable, though. It was cool. It shows you like how dominant the visual system is, right? You take that away, and then all your other athletic abilities are just like, okay, I think I know where I'm yeah. throwing it, but do I really, you know? And yeah, yeah. Well, because I mean, you have to have so much more sense of of sound and pressure and feel. Mm-hmm. I mean, I yeah, think and imagine would... imagine you know you also have to have a good feel for sport because mm-hmm. not, still the the rule of sport stays the same, which is on offense I got to create space, on defense I got to take that space away. Mm-hmm. So in your mind's eye, you're still visualizing where you need to be in time and space to get the you know, get the advantage on offense or take the advantage away on defense. Mm -hmm. And so, but now I don't have the value of sight. Mm -hmm. I have to use all my other senses in order to do that. And it was pretty rough game. Like there's a lot of people bumping into one another and fighting for the ball. And yeah, it's fantastic sport. Yeah. And that's one of the things that I was most impressed about was the fact that last night watching this stuff, they weren't running into each other. And and one guy would defend, get grab the ball, stand up, run around his teammates, and throw the ball back at his at the opponent. And I was just like, 
and no collisions, no not. Yeah. I mean, just we did see one guy. He scored it in his own net. He mm-hmm. like lost control of the ball as he was rotating, and he actually scored against his own his, on his own net. But right. uh, other than that, everything else was just precise. Yeah, like it. Like I, said, I was like, man, like you wouldn't have thought that they were blind people playing this, right? Yeah, it's a fantastic sport, and that's what I love about the Paralympics is it makes you have to think differently about, all right, well, that's really interesting. Um, I got to work with three three girls that were on the Canadian National Wheelchair Basketball Team when I was oh, in nice. Canada, and some of the, the athletic abilities that they had were just outstanding, like to be able to wheel, hammer on the brakes, tip up on oh. one side wheel so they could hit basically our fade away, right? Yeah. They yeah. would hit a fade away by balancing on one wheel and they could do it whenever mm. they wanted to have that level of control, you know, to be able to move that wheelchair any, to, any way they wanted it. It's pretty cool. And they would probably never fall over, right? Never. Wow. Never. I mean, well, like occasionally you would, but yeah. usually you're, you're tilting someone smashing into you and then yeah. you fall over. Yeah. But, but yeah, their level of control was unprecedented. Well, it was interesting too, because their three point arc is not much shorter than no, what same. you see in the nba right it's same so, so like to see these girls that were just hammering three right? pointers all the time i was just like i can't i can't <laughs> hit a three pointer <laughs> while i'm standing and these girls are making it just look like it's routine you know yeah i was like they're, they're checking that up there and they're yeah. making the shots and yeah. even the announcer said they're like Joe, folks don't think that this three-point line is like super close he's like this no. is nba NBA regulation, like yeah, I was yeah. like, holy crap, that's insane! Yeah, yeah but they make it look from easy. a much lower position than the than yeah. the NBA guys too, right? Yeah. So your arc and your need for accuracy is so much higher. Yeah. But they they make it look pretty easy. Yeah. Big time, big time. All right, brother. Well, uh, social media. As far as anybody wants to get a hold of you or follow yeah, what thanks. you're doing, yeah, um, you can reach me on Instagram at authentichealthcoach.com or I, dot com, just at authentic health coach. And then my website is authentic health coaching.com. Fantastic, John. Well, coach, it was awesome to see you and chat with you. Yeah. And, great uh, out with you guys. Yeah. Thanks for coming on. Thanks and for joining uh, us. Yeah. to all the listeners out there until next episode, be good to each other. Thank you for listening to our podcast. Be sure to hit that subscribe button and whatever platform you're on, either Apple, iTunes, or Spotify, please, if you could leave a review, we'd appreciate that. If you have any questions that we can answer for you, be sure to leave those in the comments also. If you're looking for more information on our education, our products, please go to www.stickmobility.com. And also hit that subscribe button to that YouTube channel. And don't forget our live Instagram classes three times a week. If you want to join in, grab your sticks and hit that 45-minute class. Yes.